Welcome back to another episode of B-Hall Radio. We're at episode 70. I'm your host, Brian Rowan, with co-host Tyler McLeese. And tonight we've got a really special episode. This has been a long time coming. We've got Todd Messett, 1987 grad, EIWA champion, president of the West Point Wrestling Club, currently an assistant professor at West Point teaching military science. Welcome to the show, Colonel Messett. Uh, thanks for having me. Enjoy, enjoy the show to date, and uh, hopefully I don't uh, lay an egg and make episode 70 the worst one to date. <laughs> oh, no, there's there's no way for that. Honestly, this has been a long time coming. I've, uh, I'm have i trying to keep things strategic, and we're, we're trying to get some of the... Um, you know, the eighties and nineties grads onto the show in, in the next couple of months. And so I knew that you needed to be the first one of the bunch to be on because of your legacy and everything you do for West Point. Well, thank you. Yeah. So before we get into, you know, kind of, you know, your whole upbringing and, and, you know, getting to West Point and all that um, let's talk a little bit about the West Point wrestling club. Um, you've been there since the beginning, kind of founded it. So, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to give you the floor to kind of talk about that and where it's come you know, from the beginning to now, and then just kind of like what your, what your uh, day-to-day is at West Point right now. Yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't found it. Um, so when Joe Heskett came in as a coach, he, he brought the model from Ohio State, um, understood the importance of a club and a regional training center behind the NCAA team and the benefits that can provide in terms of bringing additional coaches, providing additional uh, wrestling opportunities outside the season. And just in, in long term, then bring in some other resident athletes, um, postgrads that can then work with our guys and make them better. But uh, Sandy Kriegel was the actually the originally the first president. Um, and really, all, all the credit to standing up the West Point Wrestling Club goes to the two, the two Beths. If you remember Beth Vote and, and Beth Merritt, um, they were the original treasurer and, um, and secretary. They did all the heavy lifting in getting everything we need to do to get us through the uh, IRS, get us established as a non- not-for-profit. All that work uh, was really on those two ladies and Sandy and I just signed stuff. Um, and really my part was to get us um, operational on West Point and then we ran from there. Uh, and then Sandy uh, stepped down after about a year and then I, I moved up as the president and been the president of the West Point Wrestling Club and Regional Training Center since 2012. Um, but uh, again, it kind of serves as, as a... Uh, a background, a, a, a backbone to help the Army wrestling team, Army West Point, uh, get better. That's really our sole purpose is, is to help our athletes develop uh, uh, on and off the mat, but, but really to help the NCAA Army West Point wrestling team uh, be better in ways that cannot be funded through the university. So we help provide additional coaches. We, we provide the volunteer assistant coach, uh, works for the West Point Wrestling Club and volunteers for Army West Point Wrestling, uh, the prep school coach, is on our salary and is actually a volunteer at the prep school. Um, so the prep school and the army do not pay those two salaries. The West Point Wrestling Club does. And we've been lucky enough to bring in some fantastic coaches in those positions that have helped our guys grow and develop significantly. Um, it really helps improve that red shirt year, if you want to call it that, at the prep school. You know, that, that prep year, it helps give them some, um, some longevity and some continuity and training uh, across different classes uh, to get them ready for the rigors of Full, a full college schedule, but it's been it's been great uh, working with that and working with uh, Coach Heskett and Coach Ward uh, in in ways uh, to enhance what the Army team can do. Yeah, I saw. I mean, recently Tommy Hendricks has gotten more involved. Um, you know, I don't know what 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 his role or what his capacity is. I feel like uh, he, you know he kind of works. He likes to be in the shadows a little bit, and like all of a sudden he'll be like, "Hey, can you promote the tailgate?" And I'm like, "What tailgate?" And he's like, "Oh, we're having an Army Navy tailgate." And I was like, "Oh." Okay. Yeah. And, and he put on a great event. I mean, you know, so is he, is he, you know, kind of uh, getting a lot more involved and, you know, are you grooming him to be the next, uh, the next. Yep. Uh, he, he came on as our vice president about a year ago. Um, actually, Colonel Nick Gist, uh, who you've had on, uh, was our vice president for a little while. Um, but as he took over the head of our uh, position and all the other duties as the um, director of the physical program here at West Point, um, he, uh, he stepped aside when Tommy showed interest in, in Tommy has been fantastic for us. So he has, um, as vice president brings a lot of the, the business skills from running his own business, um, to the club and he has helped, uh, set up some of the events. Um, I still take care of the golf. He did the tailgate. Uh, we are working a, uh, EI or a, um, army Navy reception and, and tickets for the event and, uh, possibly a reception at the NCAAs. So Tommy's uh, working behind the scenes on those right now. 
Nice. Um, what, is, is, any details you can provide on like the Army Navy or the, the reception or kind of like, I know maybe things aren't set in motion, but um, any details you have? I mean, it's uh, uh, similar, similar what we did at West Point a few years back, but uh, have a, a pre-reception, um, have uh, Coach Ward come talk for a little bit, maybe give a little breakdown of the match, uh, really meet and greet, let everybody uh, see each other, meet each other, and then we'll move over to the arena. Uh, watch us uh, kick Navy's butt over in Alumni Hall and then uh, potentially a, a post-match celebration uh, reception afterwards also. <coughs> Excuse me. But more to follow on that. Um, Would the NCAA it, it, is kind of be like, like more than like, uh, like a lot of teams have, like right after the, you know, that evening on Saturday night kind of get together? Um, we're, we're trying to find the right time, uh, whether, whether it's between uh, some sessions somewhere or Saturday evening. Um, we're looking to, to do that and find a venue uh, as a way. It's kind of one of the promises we made to our uh, Army Wrestling Insiders members uh, as part of the club. Uh, we have a, an insider membership where you get some kind of exclusive news uh, stories and some content from the team. We've had cadets write about their summer experiences. Uh, we've had some other, some other videos um, of team practices and some other exclusive content. And then to members, initially we want to offer to members um, the ability to, um, to to join us in these receptions, then we can expand it to the, the full Army Wrestling family. Well, that's awesome. We uh, we sure appreciate everything you do as the president of the West Point Wrestling Club, but uh, we also do want to talk about you and your uh, journey through West Point. So um, kind of getting started, um, talk us through the recruiting process for you. Um, did you know about West Point? When did they reach out? Kind of how did that look and get you from high school to West Point? I was probably one of Coach Steers' easiest recruits, honestly. Uh, I don't want to sound, cor sound corny, but it was kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to say it was destiny, but it kind of fell out that way. Uh, my sophomore year, I grew up here in New York, and there used to be a dual meet, a kind of a state championship, unofficial dual meet tournament here in New York. Every section would send one team. So there's 11 sections in New York, um, and every section would send a team to this dual meet tournament. In my sophomore year, my high school team uh, went from section two. So that was my first experience at West Point. Never knew about it. Um, came down here for, for three or four days. Um, enjoyed it. Kind of liked what I saw. Um, I came back and mentioned it to my guidance counselor, who was our first sergeant in the local reserve unit. Um, two days later, this was before internet, but like two days later, I had a stack of books on West Point. Any, anything that was published on West Point was on my desk like two days later. Um, so, so he was, <laughs> was all for it. Um, you know, kind of started talking about it. Uh, we worked through that a little bit. And then after my junior season, just like everybody does, their, their section, their, their, you know, their area has a, an awards banquet. And Coach Steers was a guest speaker. So it just kind of seemed like these things just kept falling in line. Um, and uh, so then just kind of we got on the, the self-recruiting pitch. And uh, um, my high school coach and my athletic director pulled me in you know, the AD's oh. office once a month. And we'd call Coach Steers and kind of give a rehash on you know, where I was, what I was doing. Um, and then it kind of, kind of worked from there. And uh, I became, I actually committed before I came on my visit. Um, so, uh, I got, got my nomination, um, and I committed and then, uh, uh, I mean, I had all that and then, then, um, I got my letter. So who, who uh, were the assistant coaches at the time when you were going through the career process? Were you working? Um, with that's, that's when the coach steers did. It had a great staff. It, it was different coaches also taught in DP. So they had kind of a dual role, but, uh, coach steers at steers was their head coach. Um, we still had Coach Alitz, Leroy Alitz, who was the uh, Army head coach for, oh, geez, 40 years, 30-some 30, 30 years, 35, 40 years, was still on staff. Um, but the, the main assistant coaches initially were Romy Peltier, um, and these were both Army officers, taught at DPE and, uh, and coached on the team. But uh, Romy Peltier was a, uh, a nationally ranked Greco uh, wrestler. And then uh, Steve Hunt, who grew up in New York, wrestled at Iowa. Um, was a multi-time um, All-American, and he was. Uh, they were my first two assistant coaches, and then when Steve left, um, Lou Bannock came in and was our coach, uh, was assistant coach. And uh, same time Lou came in, Jack Spates came in, and so uh, those were really the, the coaches. So Romy Peltier, Steve Hunt, um, Lou Bannock, and uh, Olympic champ, '84 Olympic champ, and then uh, and then and then uh, Jack Spates, who um, coached the Army for a while. Yeah. And then uh, left, it took the head job of Cornell, kind of brought Cornell where they were, hired Rob Cole as his assistant. And then, when, then Jack left to go coach at uh, Oklahoma. And they coached Oklahoma for about 20 years. 
Um, still keep in touch with Jack. He's helped us a lot as, uh, you know, helped help me in developing the club and helped us as we've gone through coaching changes and, and look at the landscape of college wrestling. How were you guys able to land, like, you know, Lou Bannock, you know, Olympic champion and kind of come on staff, you know, do you know, do you have any of the, the background on that? I feel like that's. Uh, Lou was the lieutenant, was an engineer lieutenant in the army and got stationed at West Point. <laughs> I'm sure we had a little bit to do with that, but he was an ROTC um, at Iowa. And uh, so uh, him and he and his brother, his brother graduated as a, uh, as an 06, as a uh, brigade commander, his younger brother, Steve, um, um, was also in the army and wrestled. Uh, but, uh, but Lou was, uh, he said we had, I don't know if they have spots in DP or spots, whatever, but, uh, but we got Lou stationed at West Point and he was our assistant coach for, for a couple of years for my last yeah, year. Good credential group of guys. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. It was. They've gone and do some, yeah, pretty, pretty good group and they've gone and do some really good things. So. Uh, so, so talk to us a little bit about Coach Steers. I mean, we haven't mentioned, you know, we talked um, talked about a lot of the previous uh, coaches, but we haven't talked about him yet. You know, so, you know, kind of tell us a little bit about him and, you know, maybe your relationship. Is he involved at all with the program still? Or? Uh, yeah, he's, he's a mentor to me. Probably most of the, the, the guys who, who have ever you know, reached back out to him, he's reached out a lot, quite a bit over the years. Um, still talk to him, you know, regularly a couple times a year. Um, anytime I've been able to go down to Citadel for something from West Point, you know, I spent time with it, with him and Sally. Um, it, it's been great, but, uh, as a good coach, good recruiter. Um, it, especially when he and Jack's face together, they, they could sell anybody on, on about anything, but, uh, um, was good. Um, like I said, probably one of the best things he did was assemble a, a really, really good staffs. They were able to bring in folks that really added to the program. Um, and then having coach Alex on board still, um, he was no longer the head coach. He didn't, you know, and he stepped back um, and, and was there as a resource for wrestlers. Um, so one time, uh, sophomore year, I, I see coach uh, Alex on the end of the bench talking to a dictaphone, talking through the whole match. So I said, I said coach, what are you doing? He said, I'm, you know, just talking my way through and coaching and taking notes. I said, you know, can I listen? And he's like, sure. So we pulled up the tape, uh, the video, you know, back then it was a VCR tape and, uh, listen to it, listen back to his stuff. And the man knows so, so much about wrestling and really helped me develop a lot. Um, so, you know, having him still on staff with, with coach Steers was phenomenal. Um, when coach, coach Alex passed away, a little, I'll come back to coach Steers in a sec, but when he passed away at his eulogy or at his, at his, um, uh, at his, uh, you know, uh, funeral. Thank you. Um, they threw around some numbers. He had, he, he taught wrestling in DP. He coached wrestling. And then when he's done coaching wrestling, he, uh, he helped coach women's softball, but he had uh, coached at the time of, you know, when he gave, when he, when he passed away, they, they figure he had coached or taught over half of the graduates from West Point. So pretty phenomenal. Um, they've done, done a great job, but, um, but coach Steers was good. Um, he was still young if we could roll around with us and could still, could still put it out there on the mat. Um, very good personal motivator, very good personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, to talk guys and, and, and help you see what you, you know, you maybe had trouble seeing uh, by yourself. It was good. Um, winning his coach in Army wrestling history still. Um, we had top 20 ranked teams my whole time, uh, pretty much my whole four years there. Um, was, was good um, coming to West Point and, and wrestling under him. Was he, so was he on, on staff with Coach Alex, like um, before he was the mm -hmm. head? Coach no, Alex. after Coach Alex, it was Ron Pfeiffer for about 10 years. And I don't think it was quite that long. And then Coach Steers came on after that. So there was a, a eight or 10 year break from uh, from uh, Coach Alex to Coach Steers. Okay. Where was he at before uh, before West Point? Coach Steers? Yeah. He was, I think he was at William & Mary. Um, he did coach, I think he, he, he attended the Citadel. Um, he coached at William & Mary, came to, and then coached at, at, uh, at Army. And then uh, when he left West Point, he got out of coaching, and uh, and he's he was and still is teaching at the Citadel. But he's been down there in a bunch of roles, an assistant AD, doing some compliance stuff. Uh, then he was he's always been an adjunct faculty member down there, and then uh, he was the athletic director for a private school district for for a number of years. Um, from uh, and they had uh, they had like forty or fifty uh, athletic teams, so he, he managed all that for a private school district down there um, um, by the Citadel. Nice. And I think it's fascinating. Just like there's so much stuff out there that I don't mm -hmm. I feel like I know a lot about the program and I like I'm going back to, you know, the 80s and I don't I, I don't know like anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
So uh, what was so it like? You weren't born. So yeah, you know, what do you expect? I was born in the <laughs> you're, a years old. you're a couple years old. <laughs> um, so what was it like being a, a freshman at West Point back then? And um, talk, kind of talk through your progression as a wrestler transitioning from high school to, to college. Um, I wrestled 126 in high school and told Coach Steers I'd never wrestle 126 again, but that's where I ended up. Um, but luckily, a couple of years in there with Dennis Semmel ahead of me uh, for several years, I, I was wrestling at, up at 134. Um, I came in like everybody thinking I'm going to, you know, going to crack the lineup and start right away. Um, that didn't quite happen. Um, but uh, I wrestled uh, quite a bit my plebe year. Uh, we did, you know, similar um, like we do now where we had a, a bunch of open tournaments where we got a, a, a lot of folks in and I, I went to all those and I did travel, um, kind of spot travel, spot started, um, started from 26 up to 42, my plebe year. Um, and then, uh, uh, so 26 was Dennis uh, Semmel, um, a national finalist. Um, and then at 34 was Whit Gibson was our team captain. So I was kind of behind those two and, and working around. And then sophomore year, um, split time, me and uh, Chris Greer, uh, split time and I ended up uh, Chris uh, blew his knee out for like the third time and that's when I became a full-time starter we were, you're kind of splitting time up until about Christmas or, or shortly after and then after that I became a full-time starter uh, from then through my you know through the rest of my time but uh, and a place in uh, EIWA is my my sophomore year and then junior year I separated my shoulder and uh, and didn't uh, made it back to the IWAs but didn't place and then senior year I uh, won the IWAs and uh, had one loss going into the NCAA tournament, and that was from uh, Andre Miller from Wilkes. Uh, he and I had, had battles. Um, we were, we were. I think I was like uh, two, two, four, and two against him. We used to have ties, and, and we tied a couple times. But uh, on the bulk, uh, he beat me. Ended up being all American our senior year. Um, that was my only loss going into the NCAA tournament. What was the the balance like? Um, balancing the military stuff, school, and uh, wrestling um, back then. Like, what was your day to day look like? Pretty much the same as you guys saw, um, you know, uh, pretty much the same class schedule and pretty much the same workout schedule. You know, you go to class all day, um, practice at same uniform. four o'clock. What's that? Yeah, same, same uniform. uniform. <laughs> same uniform. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, school, so, you know, the only difference was we had mandatory meals. All of our meals are mandatory. You guys had a lot of options. Um, so my sophomore year is when we started getting out of lunch. Uh, to go work out. So we had our schedule. So either the hour before or the hour after lunch, you had off, and then we could go work out as a, as, you know, a second workout during the day during that time period. For, I know Brian's time, we had the first hour in the morning for most of it. So we had a morning workout and then the afternoon, um, Tyler, I think we went back and where we gave you guys the last hour off or we did some of the morning ones. So that, that has changed as coaches have changed and coaching philosophies and timeline. Um, and schedules, but uh, we, we uh, you know, I said, starting my sophomore year, we had that hour before or after lunch. So we'd come in and work out then. So that was, you could miss a meal, uh, which helped, helped with the weight. Um, it was tough having to go sit in the mess hall and not eat. Um, but otherwise, really not much changes. Uh, I worked for, for Brader General Rapp when he was a commandant. And his, his big saying was, West Point is 210 years of history, unfazed by progress. Um, so some <laughs> things really don't, some, as a, although it looks like it changes, some things really don't change that daily schedule, that daily grind for cadets, um, you know, 18 to 21 credit hours, um, you know, full, full, full course load. And then you go to practice, you know, anywhere from three 30 to four 30, whatever the schedule is during that time. And, you know, you go until dinner, go to dinner, come back for study barracks for ESP. And, uh, you know, as coach Ward says, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, do it again tomorrow. Um, but that was it. Um, our weekends were a little different. We couldn't leave on Fridays like you guys can. Uh, you know, our weekends started Saturdays because we had Saturday morning classes. Uh, but so traveling was was a big benefit. So having away matches and away tournaments was a big big benefit to get out of West Point, um, sleep in a hotel, go out to dinner in a restaurant um, after you made weight. So that was that was nice. Um, but otherwise, really, the schedule of a D1 NCAA athlete at West Point has not changed much. You know, since 1984. 83 when I got here. You mentioned um, like, so it, like midway through as a cadet, you were, you guys were able to miss lunch and like go work out. Um, was that like something new in the core that like just started? And like, you know, that was kind of like, I'm, I'm thinking of like the, the dynamic between core squad athletes and non-core squad athletes and the animosity that 
seem, seems to always be there. Like, was that there then? And uh, like trying to get into cadet gossip a little bit. What was yeah, and I think we, and I think we're responsible for building some that, you know, at the cadet level, some don't care. It's us talking about that a lot. That I think gives it legs, but um, I don't know if other teams well, swimming always had the, you know, that first hour off in the morning, they always had a morning practice. Um, and I think we just, you know, came to the realization that, Hey, we can do this too and help, you know, give guys another time to, to work out, cut weight, work on cardio and maybe lift. Um, so we couldn't get the whole team together at one time to get schedules matched, but, um, our schedules worked where we had, like I said, the hour before the hour after. So we got to, you know, work out, miss lunch formation and make it to class after lunch or, you know, miss lunch and then do the workout, you know, through lunch and get cleaned up, uh, for the, you know, the second period after lunch. Uh, don't know. Don't know if you know other teams did that. Um, uh, I'm guessing they probably did, and we just saw the light and said, "Hey, we can make this work." And here's how we'll make it work for our schedule, like we did with you guys. Um, I think it was only like on day ones you guys had the, the morning hour off, right, Brian? It was something like that. It was like one day. Yeah, one day we had the uh, on day ones we had the morning period off, yep. and on day twos we had the hour before lunch, mm -hmm. J hour. And we used to have yep. J hour lifts. Yep. So, uh, so work the schedule um, to try to make that work, and we still do that now. Um, right now we're on last, we try to get the last hour off, um, for everybody and still onesie twosies that because of their major. And of course they have take, they may not be able to do it, but, uh, pretty much right now we're last hour. We're back to last hour off for, for the team. Gotcha. So, um, you know, kind of, I want to go a little bit into the culture of like the program back then and like similarities that, you know, of today's team and, and, you know, kind of differences, you know, what was the culture like? Did you guys have any, like, mottos or sayings or you know i know a lot of a lot of wrestling kind of blends together but uh, if you could talk yeah. to that a little bit about you know just to kind of give listeners a feel for what the program was like back then no we didn't have pihaw but we did you know really that that has been the culture of army wrestling for a long time the brotherhood you know the brotherhood aspect and and, and uh, you know your warriors with attitude working to improve your you know our group of army wrestlers um, and that's pretty much what it was. We're, our class, our class was pretty tight. So as we still stay in contact quite a bit, as I'm sure others do. And, and I'll tell you, that goes all the way back. Um, I've been lucky enough to be invited to the class of 72 zoom. They have a weekly zoom meeting, uh, where they talk, you know, wrestling family, talk a lot of stuff, but, uh, they've been helping to get involved with the club recently with the, with the wrestling club recently. So I've been invited to some of their zooms. So the same thing that, you know, that team, um, that brotherhood is still together. Um, and that's kind of how it was for us also. Um, you know, there wasn't really any us against them. It was us as the wrestling team, um, you know, hanging out, trying to, trying to make each other better, trying to, and, and you know, that's who you spend a bulk of the bulk of your time with. So that's who becomes your best friends. Um, there was a little more involvement in your companies, uh, back then because you still had a lot of mandatory stuff back in the companies, but then I'm still pretty tight. A lot of my, my E2, E2 brew dogs, uh, from, from back in the, in, in the mid eighties. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, pretty much similar culture. It, it was a, a good band of brotherhood, a good band of brothers that, uh, that kind of hung together. Well, I'm sure uh, you keep in contact from your classes um, still from that, from that age range. Are you, you still have a lot of good friends from them? Uh, yeah. Uh, Dan Costigan and I still, still talk pretty much. Uh, Mike French still does. I still talk to Cliff Harris. Um, a few other ones uh, are out there. Uh, Matt Anderson, who's 88, still talk to uh, Paul Kuznick comes up on the net once in a while. Um, um, drawn by Kenny Beelan is down in Florida now. Uh, we still talk, uh, and we did a 30 year reunion for our AWA championship in 87, uh, our 87 championship team in 2017. It was, we had Navy at home and that was a time we got everybody uh, again, back together. So those that we had lost contact with, a lot of them came back, uh, from those teams in the eighties. It wasn't just your group 87, it was the, the 87 team. Um, so we had guys you know, ranging from, you know, 83, 84, up through 89, 90 that came back. And that, that was, a, that was a great event to get everybody back together. And that kind of spurred us again to, to maintain some contact. So, uh, did you organize that, um, that little reunion or kind of how did that come to be? And, um, how it started was like back in probably about 2010, uh, John Burns, um, Lieutenant Colonel, retired Lieutenant Colonel, who is our, my head OR, uh, came up with the idea. And he said, you know, since I was back at West Point, we, we needed to do that and have a 30 year EIWA championship get together. So um, it was originally his idea. And then we, we did it from there. Uh, Mike French and, and I did most of the work. Mike did a lot of the work um, from Ohio, but uh, we did a lot. I did all the kind of the West Point on site stuff. And he did a lot of the, you know, the outreach and organization uh, part. And then we brought everybody in. And Cliff Harris was involved too. A bunch of folks were. But 
so we uh, had a had a dinner at the Thayer, um, you know, the, the night prior um, with everybody there. Uh, coach came, uh, coach and and his wife came, and uh, we had uh, you know, Coach Steers was there. Um, coach Space was there with his kids, uh, all his, his his adult kids. Um, we had and we had two or three ORs. We had uh, several of the ORs come back too. So it was it was a really good event. Sounds like is that the first time you guys got together? Because it was thirty years, kind of like did you guys? It was. Before? Yep. Yep, that was the first time. And we didn't do 25 because 30 years was going to be a home match. So we had Navy at home that year. So it was an odd year, so we had Navy at home. So it was, it was a great chance to get together. And then we we beat up on Navy. Um, it's kind of you know, a, a coach word staple of um, when, you know, when, we, when we're not favored. It was kind of a toss-up uh, year. We really weren't favored. They were. And uh, he came to, you know, came, we had a little pre-reception. He came talk a little bit and, uh Basically, told us we're going to run the table from from uh, 65 through heavyweight and win the match, and that's exactly what we did. Um, it was it was good. It was a good match. Um, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic win. Good stuff. I was going to say something. I just like lost my train of thought completely. <laughs> Tyler, um, you go. I'll go. Yeah. It'll come back to me. So you, you talked earlier about how you separated your shoulder your junior year. Can you kind of talk about how. Um, the transition to your first year, you're an EIWA champ and the team was EIWA champs. Um, was that your expectation coming in of you and the team? And what was that like? Um, yeah, coming in, the championships, yes. We, we, we knew we had a chance, um, you know, kind of the same teams back then. Cornell wasn't where they are, but it was Lehigh and Navy. Um, and we also had Wilkes. Uh, was a D1 school and they had um, they had two champ or two finalists, one champ that year. So they were in the running too. But uh, we were kind of similar to, you know, current Army teams where we had, um, you know, good strength, good depth up and down the lineup. Everybody was, you know, seeing the top three or four in the IWA um, going in kind of one of those years. We had everybody there. Um, we had four, four finalists, I think, um, and I was the only one that, regrettably that, that won a title that year, but the guys who, who they lost to. Um, so Daryl the Rove lost to Pete Yazo, who was a, you know, an NCAA champ, old time All-American. Um, you know, the, we lost to guys like that, that, you know, Navy had, you know, one guy like that. Lee, I had two guys like that. Somebody else had, um, you know, somebody like that. So um, at their weight, that would have been tough to break through, but we had that, that strength of being, you know, top, you know, one, two, three, four seed throughout. Um, and going into the, the fight, yeah, WWE finals, we had already sewn up the team championship. So we could not lose the championship in the final. So it was, it was a, a great team performance. All 10 guys placed, and we sent seven to the NCAA tournament. Should have had an eight, should have had a wild card uh, for John Ripley, but uh, he kind of got screwed out of it. Um, but we should have had eight guys at the NCAAs that year. Did, um, you know, uh, your NCAA is your first year. As I was doing some research, I saw, you know, the, the Navy guy made a run to the semis. Did that, I mean, that's got to be a, I got some sour apples right there. Yep. But, um, I was, I was looking through it. I was like, oh, Navy, oh, we won the first. Match. Oh, I'm like, holy crap, he made it to the semis. I'm like, oh. he, had a, he had a good turn. He beat the number five and number 12 seed on the way there. He did. He had a good tournament. Um, Matt Treister, yep, I, I beat up on him in the duel. And then I beat up on, uh, I didn't wrestle many AWAs. Um, but, uh, um, and actually, we hosted him and his son a couple of years ago. We were recruiting it, it, his oldest son went to Navy. We're trying to get the younger one who's wrestling for Navy right now. Um, so he came. So it was good, good catching up with him. Um, he's a, he's a, uh, a, uh, a federal uh, lawyer out in Kansas, but uh, his, his sons are pretty good wrestlers too for Navy. But yeah, he had, he had a good run, but yeah, that killed me. I beat two All-Americans that year um, uh, throughout the season. Um, and then um, went one and done at the NCAAs. So back then, um, if you lost, there wasn't, there was not full wrestlebacks. Whoever you lost to had to make it to the, through the quarters in order to pull you in kind of like the repechage in, in international style. So they had to make it there. And the guy lost to, uh, did not guy from, uh, central Michigan did not. So he got, he got beat in the quarters. So, uh, uh I did not get dragged in the wrestlebacks. So uh, I was a one and done, um, regrettably as, as the 11th seed, I got upset in the first round. What, uh, how did the rest of the team do? I mean, how, like, what was the NCAA tournament like back then? You know, I guess, you know, it wasn't on TV. I mean, I remember coverage kind of, I think in the late nineties or early two thousands yeah. took like got more coverage. What was NCAA's like back then? Um, it was, was down the Friday, Saturday, six sessions kind of. 
format? Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I know much more about it now than, you know, I was going as an athlete. Uh, you know, we got down there, worried about making weight and then wrestling and then, you know, and then staying in the tournament, which I didn't. But uh, it was down at the University of Maryland. Um, you know, looked the same with, with the eight mats out, out there. Um, you know, looked pretty much the same. I think the same same sessions, same same uh, same progress. Uh, but uh, uh, the team team did well. Um, I think we placed in the in the low teens overall. Uh, we had Dan Koskin uh, come out as, our, as an All American. That team had two All Americans on it. Uh, Daryl Narove uh, was an All American in '85, I believe, and then Dan Koskin in '87. So we had we had two guys at the NCAA tournament there, that, you know, on our team, in the, on the AC team that ended up being All-Americans. Um, and then 86, Dennis Semmel as a national finalist was there. So um, during that time, so, you know, really in the year of 80, in 86, we, we had, you know, um, you know, two and then one former All-Americans on the team. Uh, but uh, a bunch of guys did well in the tournament. Regardably, I didn't. Um, I, I was a one and done chump. Um, so, Moving past that, Brian, thanks for bringing that up. I'm sure uh, Colonel Mess, I'm sure you love talking about that. Um, and no regrets, no regrets. Uh, and before my match, Coach Sears, you know, he, he's trying to tell, talk to me about this guy. You know, he's, and Coach Sears got to know me kind of, he kind of scrunch himself up and he talked like this. And, you know, but uh, he was trying to explain to me what this kid does. And you know, I'm just ready to get out on the mat and wrestle. And so what happens, the kid hits me in the move. So basically, what he did is he would shoot a, like an outside sing or a single and he'd swing around and he'd step over. And almost put himself in a Merkel and he has some kind of weird Peterson out of there. And of course, you know, he hits me with that in the first 30 seconds and I'm down five, nothing. Um, you know, came back and uh, my strength was wrestling on my feet. I couldn't turn. I was trying to tell them I couldn't. So the old let him up, take him down game. And I ended up losing nine, seven. You know, I, I came back with, you know, three takedowns or so. And I just couldn't just ran out of time. And if I had another, another minute, I probably could have caught him. So I, I cut him nine, seven or 11, nine, whatever the match was. Something like it was a two point match. Um, I cut him one more time to, you know, to try to take him down. I, I just ran out of time. Um, but, you know, I guess if I listened to Coach Steers, um, uh, I, I would have, I maybe could have stayed out of that and, and done better, but that's okay. You didn't have full wrestling back then to kind of scout, nope. scout nope. guys either. Uh, nope. really Actually, Win Magazine was it. You know, that would come out, you know, the next week. Um, and, and you'd have the rankings and you have articles and that was about it. Yeah, I feel like if coach tried to explain that to you, like right before you went out there anyway, it's like, it's yeah. too late now. We're yeah. like, we're, up, we're about to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so moving past it, so um, you graduate, uh, you commission as an aviation officer, um, kind of go through, I know you've got a pretty uh, extensive army career, but if you could just kind of hit the wave tops um, so we can dive into that. Yep, flight school, Fort Rucker, about a year and a half. Then I went to Fort Carson, uh, where I was a platoon leader, company XO, kind of the, the normal, normal progression. Um, I, I flew, uh, OH 58 D's, uh, Cowboy Warriors. So initially they were unarmed. Um, but, uh, you know, there's there one platoon of those in every division. Now with the fourth ID and did that. And then, um, after my time at Carson captain's career course, then called the advanced course. And then I went to Germany, went to the 11th ACR on the border. Um, the wall had come down, uh, about, uh, about a year and a half or so before I got there. So I didn't get to experience that part. Uh, but I got to be in 11th ACR in the, in the black horse regiment. Um, I was a, you know, that was my first troop command. I commanded there for about 10 months. And then we stood the squadron down as we were, uh, reducing, uh, the forces in Germany. Uh, so stood, stood the squadron down and I moved to first armor division. Um, they're near, uh, closer to Frankfurt. Um, there I, uh, commanded again, commanded the second air troop, um, in one, one cav, went to Bosnia, deployed the troop to Bosnia to do the initial separation of the Bosnians, the Serbs and the Muslims. Um, so the Serbs, Croats, and, and Bosnians, and uh, kind of established the peace accords. I uh, was there for, for about just short of a year, and then uh, came back, and then I, I left my branch and went to a, uh, what we used to call a functional area assignment. I got my master's in, in operations research from Old Dominion University while I was working at headquarters TRADOC at Fort Monroe, Virginia. So, so did that, and then went on to uh, CGSC at Leavenworth, and then from Leavenworth went to Drum, where I was the... Uh, um, worked on division staff for a little while until I got into the squadron and I was a squadron XO for, for about uh, two and a half years. Um, while I was there, I deployed to um, Afghanistan with the division um, as kind of an individual LNO. And uh, I worked with in, in, in Northern Afghanistan as an LNO to a third battalion, fifth special forces as they were working, doing their operations in Northern Iraq and then kind of our support, our you know kind of conventional support to them 
um, in terms of aircraft lift and some uh, security forces. Um, and then uh, came back, left drum, came to West Point in 2003. What time then, frame were you in a, um, um, deployed then originally? I mean, that, 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 was some, that was some crazy times like before. That was, so 9-11 kicked off um, and we were in Afghanistan in December. Um, so, uh, so we, we left, we left, uh, Fort Drum in, in, uh, I think it was like December 3rd. And then we, you know, took us a few days to, to get through Turkey and get through everything else and get in Afghanistan, get through Germany, get through Turkey. So we were in Afghanistan in, in early December. Did and you then, know, like when 9-11 happened, how quickly you'd be deploying or did you think? No, that? I mean, you assume it's going to happen. That, that's, that's what we do. That's what we train for. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it happened. We sent, uh, really it was just our division staff. We sent the division uh, to be a, a basically a, a combined forces headquarters, um, and uh, then I was kicked forward from that down to northern Afghanistan to work with uh, I think again third battalion fifth special forces, and uh, and those guys as as an LNO. So I spent some time there. But it, it was interesting, on, interesting times. Yeah, yeah. You kind of hit on it a little bit, um, but you know the last twenty years everything in the military has been so Afghanistan and Iraq focused. What were some of the things that West Point and the army was talking to you guys about before the 9-11 stuff, kind of like your first few years at West Point and then as a junior officer and as a company commander, like what were the, the training rotations like, or what were you, what were you guys training for? As a junior officer, it was all Soviet based threat. You know, it was all Soviets coming across the folded gap in Germany. Uh, and it was nice to get to go serve there. Uh, but that's that's what our you know our threat model was at West Point military science classes. That was a threat model in the Army, um, especially at the combat training centers at, at NTC and GRTC. Um, GRTC again, we we moved towards a more of a light model, but but at uh, Hohenfels, CMTC, and at NTC out of Fort Irwin, it was all it was all Soviet model um, doctrine that that we were fighting against. Um, after 9/11, th that did change. Um, so we you know it became more of a a uh, light hybrid model and that's really what we trained against uh, for a long time until probably in the past five years or so we started transitioning back to uh, actually what the army calls a decisive action threat environment so we built um, threat models um, a european model a an asian model uh, so there's you know not just one threat now so there's several several based on what theater you're in that you uh, that you train against and we've incorporated those into our military science class right now. So we're doing right now the, the European model. So we're fighting the Denovians and Atropia, um, but we're going to probably transition to a, a, an Asian model here soon. Um, and the Army has built these models. So we're, we're not making something up. No, we're taking a, a, a full up model that's already out there in existence with all the support. Um, can you talk about uh, the transition back to West Point? What kind of drove, what kind of drove that? Um... So when I was in Afghanistan, um, I ran into Colonel Gene Palka, who I knew as, uh, you know, from an earlier life as Captain Gene Palka was an OR for the wrestling team when I was a first team. So the picture of the 87 team that's on the wall, he took that. Um, so that was taken by Captain Gene Palka, who was then, then back at West Point. He was the deputy um, director of uh, geography and, and, uh, and environmental science. He was de de deputy department head. So he was... He and a group from West Point went over there to help um, kind of do, do some studies for um, General Hagenbeck over in, in Afghanistan. And I ran into him and, and uh, it was great to see him. And he said, you need to come back to West Point. Um, so uh, he said, you need to come back to West Point you know, and teach and work with the wrestling team. So he, you know, as I was pushing from the outside, he was pulling from the inside. And uh, uh, I was able to get back into uh, in the DMI, Department of Military Instruction. And uh, as an instructor, and when I came back, my, my job was to run the military science program, basically stand up the military science program and run the, that four semesters of, of military education for cadets. Uh, but that's that. Uh, and then Colonel Palka was, you know, uh, was a mentor of mine for my time. And then after, uh, let's see, that was in 2003, I came back, I think in 2006, um, the soup tagged him to go be the head OR for the football team. So that's when I stepped up initially as the head OR in 2006, right, right before I deployed. Um, Colonel Scott, Scott Krawcheck filled in for a year or so until I came back, and then I was a head OR again from 2007 until uh, about 2019 when Colonel Gist took over. Did you see that coming when you were a firstie or when you were? Oh, like heck no. Heck no, no, no you chance. No, as you know, you never know. Am I going to be five and, and get out? Am I going to do whatever? Um, 
you know, as I tell kids, they always ask me why I didn't get out. And I tell them that's, you're looking at the wrong way. I'm looking at it as it was always a decision to stay in because of what the army allowed me to do and provided me and my family. Um, but, uh, no, I you know, never knew, never, never thought that until I ran into, um, to Gene Palka in Afghanistan, you know, in the division headquarters in Afghanistan in, in, uh, 2000, what was that? 2002 in the spring of 2002. And that's really what kind of lit it, you know, lit the fire to come back. And, uh, yeah, I had no intention of staying here for 20 years. Um, uh, I came back for, for three <laughs> years in DMI and then deployed to Afghanistan or deployed to Iraq for a year. And then the, uh, the plan was for me to come back, stabilize at West Point for a year and get the family back together and then go somewhere else. Um, but I was lucky enough to uh, be able to stay here at West Point until I retired in 2013 and then uh, moved over as a civilian working for the Commandant as uh, the G8 or basically the Comptroller for the Commandant uh, for five years. And then a position opened up, a civilian position opened up back in DMI for me to get back and teach. And I jumped at that opportunity uh, to get back in the classroom and had that daily interaction with cadets again, that kind of missing as a, you know, as a general officer staff weenie. Um, and it's, it's been, it's been fantastic. So um, were you ever planning to get out? Like, like I, 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 I've, I've talked to a lot of like senior people who've got, who stayed in for a long time and, they, and they've, you know, I, they always talk, I had my refrad packet in, you know, at one point and like, I pulled it out, you know, were you ever close to getting out when you were like a junior officer or anything or? Um, as a first Lieutenant um, at the end of my time at Carson, um, I considered it um, was not the greatest command environment um, that, that I was in um, our battalion, our brigade. So, uh, actually my battalion, five of the seven company commanders got out of the army. If that kind of says anything about what was going on. Um, and we worked with the air force a lot, worked with A-10s a lot, uh, with, as being 58 D's, those 58 D's are my airframe. And, uh, one of the guys that we worked with out of Nellis air force base was a former army Cobra pilot who jumped over. So he was talking to me about coming over and I considered it. And then I came down in order to go to the advanced course and, so I'm going to stay in the army and give, you know, give it a shot at another, you know, another assignment. And cause my first year and a half at Carson was fantastic. Um, great unit, great commander. Um, and then, you know, just things change as you know. Um, and then, um, um, you know, after the advanced course, you know, went to Germany and we had a fantastic time and really enjoyed being a troop commander and, uh, and doing the army thing. And again, there was never, never really anything that made me want to get out. So it was, you know, I never decided to get out because I always, wanted to stay in i enjoy what i was doing did uh, most of your classmates stay in the army or did they have shorter careers most of my teammates got out um we also we were on the last tail end of the bubble when we still had you know a whole bunch of you know still 20 plus divisions in the army um at about my two to three year point the army went from 20 divisions to 12 and they basically opened up for pretty much if you wanted to leave you left and you know you could basically waive your commitment um, and some guys uh, took advantage of that and left. Um, some guys got out, came back in, got out. So, so Dan Costigan, our 190 pounder, um, all American in, in 87. Um, he got out, uh, he actually has packet in and then desert storm kicked off. He pulled it to, to go with his unit. And then after desert storm, um, he got out, um, and then ended up being in the Florida guard, uh, was a commander of a transportation company in the Florida guard. And, uh, while he was going to med school, so he was doing that to, to get himself through med school. And then after med school, he came back in the army. So the army picked up his med school tab um, and was actually stationed at West Point. Uh, was he there? Yeah, guys? he was. He was there. Yeah, I knew that. I thought he was like, so he, would... he was. Well, he was wild. He was like the the, the OG kind of Colonel Cook. Yep. Yep. <laughs> he used so to get really into it. <laughs> yep. So uh, very fired up about army wrestling. Uh, but but Dan's out in uh, California. He's a pediatric anesthesiologist. Um, so. Um, so he's come in and out of the army several times, uh, but uh, he, he's back out now. But we've had, we had some like that. Um, and some folks, uh, I'm the longest serving one from our team um, that, that stayed in uh, through that whole time. So we had probably I mean, the least we, expected to stay in for, for 20. <laughs> <laughs> so we asked the same question to Colonel Gist, um, you know, on his episode, because he's been back at West Point for a while and, you know, seeing different generations, you know, kind of. Kind of talk to us a little bit about how the academy's changed. You talked a little bit earlier, you know, but like, you know, people always joke the core has, um, you know, if there's something, you know, other things that you haven't mentioned um, about how the environment's changed, you know, for the better, like kind of what's your take on, you know, the 
AC in the barracks and, you know, those hot takes, you know, I, I know that can be touchy subjects yeah. for small grads. <laughs> yeah, it's when I was the, the comms G8 that we started putting air conditioning in the barracks. You can blame me. Uh, it just, <laughs> it's, just, it, it's just, you know, it's just science. And if you can strip body heat while you're recovering, you can perform better the next day. You know, everybody's complaining about that has air conditioning in their houses. Oh, by the way. But uh uh, it, it, it's a good thing. It, you know, that, that's one place where we were, we, we were able to make progress, you know, um, contrary to, to general reps little saying there. Um, yeah, I'm going to, going to echo Colonel Gist and, you know, the core has gotten, you know, better, faster, stronger, smarter, um, really has, um, just the amount, um, of exposure that cadets have now to things that we couldn't, and, you know, some of it is, is a product of times, um, you know, summer, um, you know, go to rest. We, we, we couldn't train in the summer. We were off doing military training. Now we have, we can work wrestling training in the summer schedules to help you know, guys develop as wrestlers in the physical pillar towards their graduation at West Point. Uh, we have other opportunities. Summer. We have, you know, more schools, more diverse military schools. We have uh, AIDs where folks can go out and kind of expand their horizons, do some research. Um, you know, some are going petting water buffaloes in Thailand or whatever, but, um, but some do have really, really valid purposes that give back to the Army, where folks go to a lot of the Army research centers or even civilian research centers and colleges and provide, you know, undergrad research to, to help expand bodies of knowledge. Um, all that wasn't available to us and, you know, wasn't expected. Now it's, you know, part of life. Um, I, I think the hardest, you know, the, big, the biggest change is um, cell phones, computers. Our, my first year was the first year Cleves got computers. Um, and you know, it's a game changer in, in terms of not just productivity, but especially now with access to information. But it makes your life harder because there's expectations now on that phone and on the computer of, of you know, contact and availability. Um, you know, we had three pay phones per floor in the barracks and there's a bank of like six in the basement. So you, you weren't expected to talk to mom, dad, girlfriend, everybody you know, for an hour every night. Um, you know, you focus on your homework and you, and you spend a lot of time with your friends in the barracks down the day room. Um, so that's where things are a little different. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's where we lost some of that company identity part, but you know, some of a lot of that now gets blamed on, on sports and clubs and things pulling folks away from the barracks. Uh, but it's not, it's, you know, the availability for social outlets where you don't have to do it with your roommate in, in the room next to you. All right. So I think that that's a lot of it, but, uh, but, um, yeah, I, I was on the cusp of getting into West Point, you know, more for wrestling, getting me and the coach stairs, chipping me and getting me in through admissions. I would have been there, you know, now I, you know, probably wouldn't even stand a chance. Um, it's, it, it really is um, developed in, in that respect, but the basic fundamentals are still the same. You know, it's rigorous academic schedule, you know, physically demanding. Um, and then, you know, we're going to do all that. And we're going to give you more work than you can probably do in a 24 hour period and get adequate rest. And you're going to have to figure it out. Um, and we're going to give you leadership opportunities to, to help you develop. You know, we're going to give you those, those stair-stepping leadership opportunities from you know, being a plebe and following, to being a team leader, to being a squad leader, um, to a leader detail over the summer, and then go do CTLT. So a lot of that's the same. Um, it, it's a good, solid leadership you know, model fundamental and, and a way for you to, to learn you know, a lot about yourself and learn a lot about how to prioritize your time and your strengths and weaknesses. Um, and that, that has not changed about West Point, and I don't think it ever will. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's always it's always good to get like kind of the perspective. I haven't really thought about that that much. You know, you could you know that aspect of not, you know the technology. I mean, you think about the technology, but not like from that aspect of you know cadets being in the day room and company identity. I mean, I never put those two things together, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. I was an F one yep. go firehouse. You go down Tuesday nights and watch Cheers. Yeah, you know, your whole class was down the day room watching Cheers on Tuesday night. Miami Vice on Friday nights. You know, because we couldn't leave till Saturday. So you watch Miami Vice on Friday night. You know, uh, now I'm really dating myself. You guys probably don't know what that is. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but you, you did that. Um, so you kind of hung out a little more together. But, um, you know, it, it, they have opportunities now to do it in, you know, their sports team or their club or, you know, some other venue. You know, the, the, the choir, the Glee Club folks are together a lot in traveling. So you build a little different identity, but you, you still have it. Uh, but but it's different. Um, that's part that's, that's different. And, and I'll get on old core rants in, in the classroom once in a while, kind of kidding. But yeah, you know, we had Sammy every Saturday morning. 
it wasn't like a once a semester thing that these guys go through now or you guys did. Um, but you know, little things like that, just change it, just, just different changes. But uh, at, at the core, West Point is still the same as it was, you know, 35 years ago um, when I was there. Thanks, Sammy, every Saturday. That's uh... yeah. But it wasn't, you know, it was the, you, you didn't have to be there, standing there, you know, we're traveling, you set up your room, you leave, kind of like AMI was for you guys. Yeah, you did that, but they got inspected and graded every weekend. So. What do you, what do you talk to uh, when you guys bring recruits on and you show them around campus? What do you guys talk to them about when you talk about the opportunities? Cause how much it's grown, like just what we're talking about, how over the last 10, 20 years, there's so many more opportunities. What are kind of the new things that when a recruit comes up to West Point, you try to show off? Uh, we like to bring them up to our, the simulation center. The, so DMI is a simulation center now. So I think you guys had the EST up there. Uh, so we take them in the EST, let them shoot some weapons, but show them that. There's also another 3D simulation called Cave. So we show them some of that, let them see a little bit of army, uh, if you will. Um, but really probably the same talk you guys had. It, it's really about, uh, you know, as an OR, if I get to talk to families and, and we typically do get to meet the parents, um, not so much the wrestlers, but the parents a lot is, um, it's really West Point, you know, if you want to look at the three academies, is really the, the one, solely the one focused on developing the individual as a leader and developing your potential. You know, the other, you know, we always talk about walk around West Point and the other academies and where do you see monuments to? West Point are monuments to people who led, who led other people through difficult times. And that's really what we try to do is develop that part of you to make you the best you can be. And that really um, goes, you go to the other academies and you see monuments to airplanes, to ships, to an anchor. I don't know why an anchor, but an anchor. Um, so you think, see things like that, but it's really about their systems, about managing systems and not about leading people and developing yourself uh, to be the best you can be in that aspect. And that's really what West Point is. Um, and to me, that's really what a wrestler is. So they wouldn't be coming to West Point as a recruit if they didn't have the, already the skills you know, to show that they're one of the best wrestlers. But to get there, they have that individual discipline if they have, to have to have as an Army officer to be the best you can personally be so you can contribute as part of a team. And that's really what, as you guys know, that's what Army, the Army is. It's a team sport. But each individual has to contribute to the best of their ability to make the overall team work. And that's the same thing that we have on a wrestling team. You know, each individual weight, you know, it's where wrestling's unique. It's an individual yet team sport. Each individual weight has to, has to do everything they can to be the best they can be to contribute their weight class. So over the 10 weight classes, we can be winners. Um, so that's, that's, you know, how I like to talk to, to, to folk, to parents and recruits. And as you know, you know, wrestlers are, are ideally suited for West Point in the Army. Um, you know, you've gone without food. You've gone, you know, you're not afraid of hard work. Um, you've done, you've put yourself in, in the physically demanding and exhausting positions and you've come through it and you've done it again. Um, and that's, you know, that's soldiering sometimes. Um, so um, that, that's what I like to, to talk about and that's what we show them. And, and we do talk about the opportunities, you know, guaranteed job five years at the end, which, you know, some people are interested in, but really it's, we, we really, I really like to pitch the individual development opportunity that we provide um, to help young men grow into, um, you know, good adults. So kind of before we wrap things up, um, you know, we definitely want to hear, and usually we say, you know, who, give us your top three, but I feel like with your uh, insight to the program, I should say, give me your top 20. Um, <laughs> but, uh, who do you think we should have on here in the future? I know we talked a little bit about it. Um, yeah. basketball. You, you've got a lot, you, you threw some names out there in the beginning. I guess who from like the, you know, the eighties. Um, if we're talking eighties, um, you have to have Paul Merritt on here, Paul, Paul and Beth. So you guys know, I mean, they, they are the first family of army wrestling. Um, they have been. So Paul, um, they got here in 88, I believe. And then he finally retired, I think in 2017, 16 or 17. Um, so they were involved with, you know, 30 years of army wrestling and really was the, the lifeblood of the program over, you know, through many coaches. Uh, so Paul was an OR, he got out of the Army, stayed on at West Point as a civilian, and uh, was the volunteer assistant coach for many years. So he was responsible for, for taking, um, you know, non-starters, if you want to say that, or B, B squad, or whatever you call them, to all these open tournaments. So, so guys, even if they weren't in the starting lineup, would get 20, 30, 40 matches a year and be ready to step in. Um, so, so he did that, and, and then he and Beth, as you guys know, was the, the were the sponsor family for all the firsties. Um, so they, they really helped 
the program uh, grow and survive and, and strive. So you got to have Paul on. And if you want to have Beth join her for part of that, that would be even better. Most, most importantly, they hosted the Ice Cream Social. Yes, that's right. They, that's that's more our building event of, you know, my West Point career. Yeah. <laughs> now we all go to Coach Ward's house and do that. Um, but um, uh, let me see. Uh, we, we talked a little bit. So, so Dan Kowski would be a good one. He, he's a good character. Cliff Harris. We can talk about my classmates. Um, Dan, All-American. Um, you know, Cliff was a uh, multi-time EIWA placer and a multi-time national qualifier. Um, still involved in wrestling. He and his brother, Robbie, who uh, is also an Army wrestler, have been coaching uh, youth wrestling down in Georgia for a while. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the obvious ones, my other classmate, Dave McCormick, um, um, maybe Dan Sullivan, some other folks have been, been successful. Um, Dave Pinder, um, who, who uh, is an Army wrestler, 86, is now the, the CEO, I believe, believe he's the CEO of Cardinal Group. Um, so uh, a few names that, that can take, you know, what they've done outside the Army uh, to bring. Um, uh, maybe uh, we, we had a couple, of, uh, we had J the Johnson brothers, a couple brother groups, uh, Mark and Chris Johnson, um, who, uh, who Mark was, I believe, 83, maybe earlier. He was before I got there. And then Mark, who was our heavyweight, uh, 85. Um, and, and Chris has, has still been involved with the program and keeping in touch um, and, and coming to some of our events and, and helping host uh, some receptions before the IWA uh, one time. And then uh, the Perrietti brothers too, uh, Mike and Dan, who are both team captains for us and live locally and, and still uh, check in with us once in a while. A uh, few names. Um, we can get a few others out there, but uh, Matty Anderson, class of 88, um, our, our 34 pounder after I went down and then he wrestled out his senior year, uh, but uh, he retired as a, as a colonel out of Leavenworth. Um, he's still involved in, in uh, wrestling, youth wrestling in Kansas and uh, works for admissions as a, uh, as a Malo, as a military academy liaison officer, helping folks through the admissions process. Where, do you and know of where course, he, what's that? You know where in Kansas he's at? Um, He's uh, still near Leavenworth, I believe. Okay. I have his info. I have a, my sister just moved there with uh, yep. my brother-in-law. So I'm like, oh, are they close to there? <laughs> uh, Paul Kuznick, um, 89, um, or 90, excuse me, 90, um, would be another good one. Dave Bear, class 90, be another good one. To have on. There's, there's a bunch, you know, a lot of them are. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't, you, you, you mentioned a lot of the ones you mentioned, I'm, I have I have pegged. Um, yep. But a few of them I haven't. Yeah. yeah. Well, you gave me a lot of homework. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, just get them, get them, get them all in contact, and get them. We'll just get them training yeah. week after and, week. It's hard. My army wrestling is now it's kind of ends at ninety because you know then yeah I was gone out in the army for you know fifteen years or so, um, you know kind of keeping track from the outside. Um, you know much easier now to do that than it was back then. So then you know back then it was a phone call a couple of years back to whoever the head coach was and and chat the ear off and. Hopefully they're not just rolling their eyes on the other the phone. Anytime I was home, you know, I grew up two hours from from West Point. I'd come down and see the coaches, coaching staff, see the team, but still hard to keep in touch. Um, you know, pre-internet days. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, appreciate you having me on the show. You know, Tyler, anything to add, you know, before we close things down? This was uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, this was a really good one. It's good to talk to you again, sir. Me too. And if I could one last time to, to do the sales pitch a little bit on the Army, but on uh, the West Point Wrestling Club, um, really what we're trying to do is to connect with all of our alumni, all of our families, all of our supporters, um, let you engage with the team and the coaching staff, and then, you know, elicit your support. Um, comes in many ways. Comes in, you know, letters to, to, the, to the team. It comes in, you know, keeping track, showing up at, at away matches and home matches. And then, of course, financial support is what we're always looking for to help us um, Get the army team over that that next hurdle um, to keep us to get us you know keep us ranked in the top twenty, top fifteen, top ten, and start putting guys on the um, EIWA and NCA podium. That that's our ultimate goal is to put guys on on the podium. And uh, with with your help, we can do it. But it's, it's not a one way. We're not just asking for your money. Uh, we want you to connect and engage again with the team and become part of the army wrestling family. And in the past few years, we've been successful to really expand. But we're still missing a lot of folks. We want to get you, Bihar Radio is a big one to get you in there. So, so keep watching Bihar Radio, share it with your friends, um, get folks back into, um, you know, being connected to Army Wrestling. That's where we want you. You're, you're part of the family. Um, come on back. Uh, we want you uh, to join us. That, that's, and that's really where we're going with, with the club um, to, you know, kind of expand that so we can better support our team that we grew up with. Awesome. Yeah. Well, 
Awesome. Thank you. All those thoughts. Appreciate those. Uh, you know, you saying that, saying that again, because the listeners, you know, the more they hear it, you know, they, if you're listening on this and you've gotten th this far in the episode, <laughs> you're, you're, <laughs> one of the, you guys, for the three of you that are left, the three of you are left, give me, give me a call. We'll get you in the club. Well, actually, I was looking at some of the, the our, our statistics. 17% of our listeners have listened to all the episodes. So I think that's pretty good. Um, I don't think I have. Sorry. No, <laughs> I missed a couple. I, I, can't even I, again. I actually haven't listened to one. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I get in the treadmill is when I put them on. So if I'm not working out enough, uh, that means I haven't listened to, to, to all. But I missed a few. I probably missed maybe maybe half a dozen. And I keep going back and, and picking, picking them off more than I missed. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks again and uh, have a good night. All right, take care, guys. Good night. Thanks for tuning in to the B-Hall Radio Show. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe and leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. If there's something you'd like to hear on a future show, reach out to us on any of our social media, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Or you can reach us at email, bhaw.radio at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts, and as always, go Army, be Navy.